Hey guys, Kenna here. So today we're going to be taking a look at biomass. Now, bio is the prefix for life. And so we're dealing with living and mass is just material. So this is the energy that we get from utilizing living material directly. So let's look at our essential questions. Number one, what is biomass and how is it used? Number two, what are the differences, different types of biomass? Number three, what are the advantages and disadvantages of biomass? And then four, we wanna look at a special segment of the market that's kind of growing right now, and that's algae. So what are the benefits and drawbacks of algae fuels? So what is biomass? Well, it's a renewable energy source coming from biological materials such as plants, animals, microorganisms, and from organic wastes, things like manure and dung. Algae is the most energy efficient form of biofuel that we've discovered so far. Now, when you think about oil and the fossil fuels, you, you may be wondering why this is not considered biomass. And largely it's because it's not considered renewable. Um, but they're using the same basic materials, right? Biological materials here, if they were kept under the earth for a long period of time under immense heat and pressure, they would become fossil fuels but we can use them directly here and they are renewable in that form. So if we look at biomass as a renewable energy source, we're thinking about wood, wood waste, charcoal made from wood, agricultural crop wastes, things along those lines in most cases, especially in developing countries. These are used for heating, cooking, industrial processes and generating electricity. Now, Keep in mind that wood is renewable only if harvested more quickly, if not harvested more quickly than it's planted. So there is a limit to how fast you can harvest the wood before it no longer is a renewable resource. And in many less developed countries, you're seeing a fuel wood shortage because they're harvesting things faster than they can regenerate to provide those fuels. All right, so what are the types of bioenergy that we're looking at here? Well, the first one that you're probably thinking of in, in your mind is the biofuels. Most of these are going to be liquids, methanol, ethanol, butanol, biodiesel, but this also includes gases, methane, and hydrogen. We can get bioheat by burning wood. You may have a wood pellet fireplace. You may have a regular old school fireplace. These are examples of bioheat. And then the last one, which we'll spend less time on here, is bioelectricity which we're using combustion in a boiler to turn a turbine to make electricity or developing a microbial fuel cell uh, to go ahead and produce the electric potential. Okay. Let's start out with biofuels. So biofuels are gas or liquid motor vehicle fuels derived from biomass. Most of these come from corn and sugar cane, but they can be derived from vegetable oils, plants, plant waste as well. The advantages of these over gasoline and diesel fuel are that they can be grown in many different places, they can help us to reduce our dependence on imported oil, more domestic source. They have no net increase in carbon dioxide emissions. So with greenhouse gases, as long as we're careful with our harvest, we're not increasing. Remember that whole renewable piece we were talking about? If you over harvest, now you're taking carbon dioxide and releasing it back into the, into the atmosphere. And biofuels are pretty easy to store and pretty easy to transport. Some of the big benefits that we see with traditional fossil fuels. Now, ethanol and butanol are probably two of the bigger uh, liquid biofuels that we look at, along with biodiesel. Uh, ethanol and butanol can be used in gasoline engines, either at low blends, up to 10%, or in high blends in flexible fuel vehicles, or in pure form in adapted engines. So the engine, the combustion engine that we currently use, can be used in some respect with these, and you'll actually see some of your fuels already that have some ethanol, uh, again, but below that 10% margin. Um, biodiesel can be used both blended with fossil diesel and in pure form, and its acceptance by car manufacturers is actually growing. It can be used to produce electricity or fuel for transportation, including things like ethanol and biodiesel. So biodiesel uses in blends below 5% does not require any modification of the engine. So that's pretty cool. So we can add some biodiesel to our standard fuel and it doesn't change the engine that we have to use. If we have, if we go to 100% biodiesel, you do have to make some modifications to the engine, but it can still work pretty directly. Um, 
When we start looking at biogas from anaerobic digestion, it's mainly going to use on-site for cogeneration applications. This is where we go ahead and use it for heat or something. And then we also go ahead and do a turbine movement so we can produce electricity, things like this. Uh, and this has become increasingly common in places like um, dairy farms, where they can go ahead and collect manure and put it into things like anaerobic digesters. So if we're talking about the direct plant material, um, ethanol in particular, corn and sugar cane are the two big ones, but we also see rice, sorghum, and sugar beets. Now those should all sound familiar to you because those are all things that we actually consume as food sources as well, which we'll talk more about later, okay? Ethanol is produced by fermenting and distilling the sugar or starches in these materials. I'm not going to talk much about these today. Uh, there's a whole, you could do a whole research project on just hydrogen fuel cells. We do use this in some applications. Um, it's not currently used in terms of the road for cars right now, uh, but they are working on hydrogen fuel cells and doing some testing with this in automobiles. Methane can be combusted directly. And so they're looking at methane cars, but um, that hasn't taken off so far, but it may in the future, we'll have to wait and see. So those are our liquids and gases. Now let's move on to bioheat applications, which most of you probably have done at some point. For over a century, wood was the primary source of energy in the United States. Whether it was small scale heating systems for your household, typically firewood or pellets, or a medium scale user, typically burning wood chips and great boilers to produce more energy, or even in large scale boilers that are able to burn huge variety of fuels, including wood waste and refuse derived fuels. It is still the main source of energy in South America and Southeast Asia and provides 20 to 80% of the energy demand in most countries, okay? So when we start looking at this, there's a lot of potential and we still use, especially in many parts of the world, a lot of biomass. Um, Here's that cogeneration we were talking about before, uh, the combustion of those biofuels, um, followed by water vapor cycle driving a turbine is one of the main technologies that produces electricity. But there's also the microbial fuel cell. And I'm not gonna go into great detail here, but if you're interested, this is another technology you can investigate. In a microbial fuel cell, electrons flow from an anode through a resistor to a cathode where electron acceptors are reduced. Protons flow across a proton exchange membrane to go ahead and recharge this battery. And so in this regard, a microbial fuel cell in which biomass fuels are directly converted into electrical energy by going through an ox redox um, reaction is a promising technology. And essentially you're creating a, a living battery to go ahead and produce the electricity. So we've seen a variety of different options within the biomass category. Is this a potential energy source? Well, in the United States, we already get about 45 billion kilowatt hours of electricity from biomass. It makes up about 1.2% of our nation's total electric sales. Estimates of the ultimate potential for biomass vary, but uh, depending on agricultural forecasts, weight redu waste reduction, paper recycling, these types of things. The Department of Energy, however, believes that we could produce 4% of our transportation fuels from biomass, or maybe even up to 20%, depending on how much investment goes into the technology and how much buy-in we get from the consumer. As far as electricity is concerned, the U.S. Department of Energy estimates that energy crops and crop residues could supply as much as 14% of our power needs. Now, let's use some examples here. California produces more than 60 million bone dry tons of biomass a year. 5 million are now burned to make electricity. If we were to use all 60 million tons, we could make close to 2000 megawatts of electricity. And that would give us enough energy to power 2 million homes. About 6% of Canada's energy needs are currently met by biomass but that number could actually be increased a fair amount, okay? So what are the advantages of biomass? Well, it's a renewable energy source. Again, as long as you don't over harvest the materials you're using and it's available everywhere in the world. Everybody's got some 
you know, organic biomass material that they could go ahead and farm. It's generally a pretty low fuel cost compared to fossil fuels, especially if you're going to do full cost pricing and can reduce our dependence on foreign oil. Biomass as a resource can easily be stored in large amounts and produced on demand. You just feed in what you need to go ahead and get the energy that you need. This can help boost our economy and create some jobs, especially in rural areas. It's a great use of waste products. There's awesome recycling potential here. And it protects clean water supplies and reduces greenhouse gases. But as with everything, while it has many advantages, there are also drawbacks that must be considered in order to ensure efficient implementation. First and foremost, uh, the disadvantage of biomass is the land requirement. You got to grow all this stuff. And if you're growing it for energy, you're not using it for food, either for us or for our food. We get a generally fairly low energy content out. We can't provide enough energy to match the demand that we currently have. So we're going to have to figure something out with respect to that. You have that competition I just mentioned for the resources with food, feed, and material applications, things like particle board or paper. We could increase the amounts to get more and satisfy more of that energy demand, but that also could increase deforestation and loss of biodiversity, especially in less developed countries. If we lose plant coverage, this leads to an increase in soil degradation and erosion. And the, the techniques that we have are not that efficient, so they're not currently developed enough to rely on as a very steady energy source. And while they may not produce a whole bunch of greenhouse gases, you will likely see an increase in NOx emissions, which could have an impact on air pollution as well. Um, with more harvesting, you have to plant more trees uh, because you're going to be using them in higher quality quantity. So what we've discovered in trying to utilize more of biomass is that trees and other biomass are pretty hard to gather and there's a fairly low energy output, about 34% energy gain. Okay? Um, development of cheap and reliable combustion techniques that will not release pollutants is a noble investigation. Uh, but the development of gasification techniques that incorporate hydrogen into syngas may be one of the more interesting areas to explore. But overall, biomass contains less energy per pound than fossil fuels, noticeably. And it's fairly cost inefficient to transport for more than 50 miles before it's converted to fuel. So let's think about the big ones that have made headway in terms of the energy market so far. First one is ethanol. Is ethanol the answer? Well, it can be made from sugarcane, corn, switchgrass, and various wastes. So there's a lot of different potential sources. The biggest one in the US is the corn. We are the largest producer of you know, ethanol and we do make it from corn, but it has a fairly low net energy. Second highest is Brazil and they make theirs from sugarcane, which has a medium net energy. So it's a little better than corn, um, but still fairly inefficient. So we need to start evaluating the use of algae and bacteria which are the most widely used of the biofuels right here, the ethanol. Okay, added to gasoline to increase octane and improve emissions quality. There are some companies already doing this. And as long as it's in low amounts, or if we're gonna use high amounts, we make small modifications, it can be used in our standard gas engines. But we really have to think about the fact that a lot of us eat corn. A lot of our food eats corn. Um, there's not enough land area to grow crops for both food and biodiesel. There just isn't. And the bulk of corn grow in the U.S. to provide animal feed and the food ingredient, high fructose corn syrup. Those are the two biggest uses of our current corn crop. So if we're going to switch more to this bioethanol from corn, we're going to have to plant a lot more corn. Where's it going to go? And if farmers begin to sell their corn to ethanol producers, what happens to the demand? Uh, for those high fructose corn syrup or for animal feed or even for our consumption. The price of corn is going to go way up in the national market. And what does that do to the economics for us as consumers, for the farmers that produce it? What kind of products are, are going to be most affected? There's high fructose corn syrup in a lot of products. So, okay, 
maybe ethanol from corn is not a very efficient model. What about biodiesel? Okay. This is typically produced from leftover vegetable oils, animal fats, recycled greases, and the European Union countries produce 95% of the world's biodiesel. It's used in diesel engines, so we have diesel cars here in the US, and it's currently used in some federal, state, and transit fleets. But again, the crops require large amounts of land, and making biofuels uses energy, and typically that comes from fossil fuels. Okay, so maybe biodiesel isn't a perfect fit, although there is definitely some potential there. Now let's take a look at algae fuels. What are the benefits of algae fuels? Well, high productivity relative to terrestrial feedstock, so land-based materials, uh, you get a lot more ethanol out of this. So that adds value to what's considered fairly unproductive or marginal lands that you can go ahead and grow these algal fields. You're able to use waste and salt water, so you don't have to use our high quality drinking water. And so we're not using a material that we would use other otherwise. We're able to recycle carbon dioxide, so we're taking carbon out of the atmosphere. And we're able to provide co-products such as protein to meet the animal needs in terms of feed. So pretty cool, there's a lot of benefits from this. And it produces a range of biofuels, everything from gasoline to diesel to jet fuel to ethanol. We can refine the growth project process in terms of our algae bioreactors to make more of what we need. This has the potential to be a high impact feedstock and increase the US domestic biomass feedstock program by a potential 5 billion gallons a year. So there's a lot of upsides. So let's take a quick look at some different fuel producers. Here's what they call an algae bioreactor. You've got essentially giant test tubes filled with algae. And as we let the algae grow, it's gonna manufacture these materials. Or if you want a more controlled setting, you can do it inside a laboratory and something like this. But in both cases, essentially you need light to go ahead and grow the algae to produce the fuel. So here's your bio algae, diesel, algae biodiesel, okay? There are some significant challenges, however. Uh, the two biggest overarching challenges um, are reducing the cost of production. Right now, the setups are really expensive. Once they're in place, the costs go down dramatically, but it's really expensive to get going. And in order to ensure sustainability and availability of the resource, volumes must be enormous and can take a lot of land, okay? Um, so how do we scale this? Current commercial technologies are designed for production of high value products rather than yielding large scale amounts of those products. So how do we balance the quality versus the quantity that we're gonna go ahead and need? Um, nutrient recycling has limited its use currently, although they're working on techniques to improve this. Carbon dioxide delivery requirements are still limiting how fast this can grow and cultivation requires significant water resources. Yes, it doesn't have to be super clean water, but we still need water in order for the algae to go ahead and grow. Um, and so we start looking at these production processes and we have to go through these extraction and purification and utilization. Um, it still takes time and it still takes money. And over time, we will get more efficient. We just will. Uh, as we refine the processes, get better at seeing what's needed, how that can best be accomplished. So there are both advantages and disadvantages to our algae biofuels, just like everything else. But biofuels are a growing industry for energy products and, and things that we're using every day. Everything from diesel to ethanol helps us to continue taking advantage of the benefits of modern infrastructure while reducing the impact of those activities on the environment. Okay, so we're not having to invest in entirely new ways of doing things because we can modify what we currently have to make it work. Countries might look at the opportunity to develop biofuels for a variety of reasons, whether it's a desire to reduce domestic reliance on imports or a desire to help the environment. One of the most promising biofuel projects currently under development is the use of algae. And so I think over time, if we can solve some of the scaling issues 
you're going to see a rise in the biomass portion of the uh, renewable energy production. Okay, so um, that's all I've got for you guys today. Take care of yourselves, stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.